sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night. I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. Welcome back to the Greatest Music of All Time podcast, Davey. Uh, an honour as always to have you on the show, especially because we're talking about your solo work, uh, which as much as I am a huge fan of the Elton John band, is actually more interesting to me and probably a lot of fans. Um, I, I wanted to ask this my first wow, question. Thank you, Tom, but I think you're going to be more controversial than I am. <laughs> well, but big Elton John band fans have heard those records so much. And if you're a big fan of your work and Nigel, it is good to hear some solo stuff from you because, yeah, my first question was going to be, when was the last time that you made a solo record? An actual solo record was 1973, I suppose, uh, Smiling Face. In fact, that's the only other solo record that I've made. Uh, when I joined, just after I joined Alton, um, probably the first thing he asked me was, you know, well, now that you're in, a member of our, our little organization, I'm going to form a record company called Rocket Records, and would you like to make a solo album? And it was like, sure. So I guess I was almost, I think I was the first artist Myself and um, Kiki, Kiki D and um, Lawn Dancer, which uh, contained Nigel's brother Kai. All right, and also Dave Stewart, who's a yeah, mate of mine so. as well. But Dave, Dave was like a, a very annoying little northern git in those days, <laughs> and um, it, it was funny. He's a hilarious guy, and um, yeah, we were all very close back then. It was just like a, a, a merry band of nutcases, you know. It's great. And uh, yeah, because Dave Stewart mentioned that. And I thought it was that same band. So they, Long Dancer supported you guys when you were playing with Elton, right? That's right. They, they did, I think it was an Italian tour they did with us. Because uh, I remember we locked Dave in a wardrobe and turned it on its side um, <laughs> somewhere, somewhere a bizarre place. Um, he, they may have done some gigs in England too, but I can't remember. But yeah, they, they did a few opening things for us back then. And when you made that solo record, you know, at that time was your mindset, I'm going to be playing in the Elton John band for, you know, 50 plus more years? Oh, no, no. I, I think back then my mindset was exactly one day at a time, which has kind of come around again. That's the way I live now. Um, but in those days, it was just like we were enjoying the moment. Uh, we were loving all the music we were making. That was the, that was the whole point. Um, I mean, it was great to have, you know, finally to have some money because um, I'd been really slogging since I left, because I left Edinburgh when I was uh, just 17 for London. So uh, although it was a, a short three years, it was still, you know, it was still difficult to keep money, to keep any kind of a flow going. Um, so I was living on porridge, Guinness and pasta. That was, that was about it. And uh, which I still love to these days, except Guinness, unfortunately. Um, but um, yeah, it, it was all such a, a fast fast moving train that we were on uh, back then and um, I was just happy to be one of the passengers and enjoying it. So you so yeah you definitely by the sounds of things weren't envisaging the massive career that you've had on that front um, for all this time but what about when you made the solo record did you think I well, kind of like working by myself you know working for someone else isn't so good or did you just think you were going to make one album? Um, it was really just a one-off because, because quite honestly, I've always been somebody who makes somebody else's music better or contribute to writing or play interesting guitar or other kind of instrument parts to their music. That's, that's even uh, as soon as I went to London when I worked with people like Ralph McTell and, and Cat Stevens, uh, you know, 
people that I knew back then, uh, Noel Murphy, um, uh, folk people that I was working with essentially back then, uh, Colin Scott. So I did a lot of that work and um, I don't think anybody who's a real hard working, hard thinking musician, I don't think you ever imagine that it's going to last more than well, you don't even think how long it's going to last. I know I didn't. I didn't have a career plan like, yeah, I'll do this for a few years and then I'll join a big rock band for a few years and then I'll retire. It wasn't It wasn't like that at all. I was literally living for each piece of music that we that we came up with. It was nothing to do with how long it's going to last. It's funny because I, I, I remember watching, uh, hearing a, a Beatles interview with Ringo and he, I remember him saying, this was, they had been hugely successful for maybe one year. And he was asked, um, so what do you plan on doing now that you're this giant, you know, this thing, you know? And, and he said, well, I was thinking of opening a chain of hairdressers. And he <laughs> seemed, he was entirely on it. That's what he thought he was going to do. I mean, there was no, this was not him being his witty self, which he certainly is now, as I can attest, he's hilarious, a wonderful dry sense of humor. But the way he said, no, I, I, think, I'm, I think I'd like to have a chain of hairdressers, <laughs> was like, okay, that's what he wanted to do. And I, I, and I know that um, people who have, who early on in their career, if they have success in their life, if they're fortunate enough, the goals aren't that grandiose back then. You really just start thinking about about you know when is it all you don't really think about when's it all going to end but you think it this can't last forever surely so i mean i've been really blessed that, to have this long of a career especially with the same same band uh and yeah. and also having the 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 good fortune to work with so many other amazing musicians uh in my career which has been really, really amazing yeah, there's so, there's so much incredible stuff that you've done. And I mean, just talking about Ringo there, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to get sidetracked for too long, but I did want to know whether you'd seen uh, the new Get Back uh, film, the new Beatles movie. Not yet. I, I, I'm kind of terrified to sit down and w for that long a time. I think I'm going to wait until we go on tour when yeah. I have time and I'm on my own and what on a plane or in a hotel room or something and It'd be good for that be great for that i don't think i can handle it right now um plus you know i'm such a beatles fan um do you think uh, you've kind of seen it all, heard it all not really but but i'm i'm not sure if i want to see all the other things that i don't know about or yeah. that i'm not aware of I, I don't i don't want i'm a bit terrified of finding something and going Oh, what a drag! You know, I, I'd almost rather just keep it, keep my keep the my, my to feeling it. Of, of of my allegiance to them. Uh, yeah, uh, I know, know what you mean. I, yeah, so I don't. I also, I don't feel like I need to know everything. You know, I think it'd be interesting. So I'll I'll wait till I'm on tour and I'm sitting around on a plane or something, and I'll check it out then. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm only halfway through it, and I've okay. got to say that what you what you said there about not wanting to know every last thing. I mean, that's the way that pop stars and like rock stars are now. Do you think that something has been lost with all this access that fans have to every last vestige of a, of a, of a star's life? Was yeah. there something in this kind of... Because there's no footage, for example, or very limited footage of you guys recording in the 70s, right? Like, like hardly any. Well, nobody really... We didn't do that kind of thing back then, which is really bizarre. I mean, uh, yeah, I... Take your first part of the question. Yeah, definitely. I think the whole thing's been, you know, way overdone. Because I mean, but then again, that's for the people who the current see for the last five, six years, or whatever it's been, maybe ten years. This whole you know the American Idol thing, the Voice, and all these spin-off different programs. I mean, it's all great uh, for these people. I mean, I just can't watch that kind of thing. I can't do it. My wife loves it, and my kids enjoy checking in. But that whole thing that started to happen with too much information and this whole thing and then that bleeds over to people magazine and all these other journals and whatever online things that are talking about somebody's life and yeah it's way too much i, I mean it's awful in fact it's, it's really embarrassing for the most part you know I, so i'm glad see when one of our sensibilities when that we decided to have when we had the band in the first place it was just you know elton myself dean nigel and it was like okay we don't do tv so we're not going to do tv 
um, you know, and we don't do this and we don't do... For some reason, that was kind of the, the cool thing about the early 70s. Um, we wanted to say, well, no, we're above that, so we don't do that. Uh, it was kind of like that. So we didn't do a lot of stuff. I mean, Elton did all the solo interviews, but you'll, I don't think, I don't think you'll find any stuff with the band doing like any, any rock and roll stuff, really, you know, any Even programs gigs. at that time. There's not many, not much footage no, of gigs. Like, no, no, those, very, very yeah. little, very, very little. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to um, do some digging and, and find some footage from um, one of our lighting guys, John Babcock, um, who was a wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, he had some one of those Super 8 things back then. I, I don't know if it was called a Super 8, but back in the 70s, a little movie thing. And and also our tour manager, Marvin Tobolsky, uh, took some, some stuff. So I did some digging and came up with, uh, you know, the, the Marvin's son, Stevie, has been wonderful. And, and John Babcock's uh, kid, uh, Jack Toothman, has, has been very kind to... To, to allow us access to some of that footage from my documentary, which we're, we're actually getting really close to, to getting a, a finalized deal for. So I can't talk much about it because when I did on your last one, um, you know, the Brits, the British press got onto it and started oh, yeah. talking about this and that and the next the way they do. So, yeah, so yeah. I'm not going to talk I much about it. I couldn't believe that. Yeah. That hardly ever happens as well. Like yeah. in this podcast, there've yeah. been some things where people have said things and I thought, Hmm, I wonder whether anyone will pick up on that and nothing's happened. And then yeah. that was like literally Yeah, they jumped on, on an M eight and other things like that. But in any case, whenever it comes out, yeah. I'll definitely be uh, yeah. watching that uh, several times. But yeah. I wanted to ask you, after so long, uh, what made you want to make a solo album? I was gonna have another hit of this is water by the way. <laughs> Not back when we do this. Liquid death. Sounds like it should be. Anyway. <laughs> why why now after such a gap since to make the a record to make a record well mainly i mean i've done things when we've had time off previously um in 90 when we had that whole year plus off when elton was doing his recovery um guy babylon and myself and bob birch um i kind of assembled these these people um I met Guy, for example, on a session in 1987 with a band called Jace that I was working with, and they were great, and Guy was amazing. And so I, I remember thinking, I'm going to use that guy if I ever, you know, do anything else. So when this time off came in 1990, I think it was, um, I contacted Guy and, and we started cutting some stuff in his studio here in L.A. And, um, and then I found Bob Birch, the bass player, via Guy Babylon. And then I asked Nigel Olsen uh, if he'd like to come and play drums on it. So we, we formed a band called Warpipes. Oh, and Guy and I um, and my good friend Steve Trudell, we wrote all the music and uh, all the songs. And um, we made this really great little album at the time. Unfortunately, it, the timing was bad, I think. I don't think people were ready um, right then for like a classic rock type of spin back, you know. Um, it's a great what, record, I've got it on CD. I think it's a really good record, yeah, I'm really pleased with it. And I think I'm gonna try and do some kind of a, a rework of it, um, you know, now that I've, you know, I've got some ideas about how I'm gonna address some of my other work that I've written and maybe hasn't been released to its full capacity where people have had, haven't had a chance to really hear it. Mm -hmm. So so I'm gonna do that with some of those albums. But yeah, it, it's, um, when it was, quite obvious that I wasn't going to be traveling much after March 2020 and um, I mean nobody knew how long it was going to be obviously none of us knew that who knew it was going to be two years you know yeah yeah unbelievable but I decided to just um because I always enjoy sitting around writing instrumentals or whatever else um I don't like like to sit down and say okay I'm going to write a song right now um I tend to write uh, coming up with some instrumental ideas and and occasionally it'll be like oh that'd make a great song but then usually i think well i'll never have time to finish it because i'll be back on the road with elton and that'll be it you know it'll just gather dust somewhere until i'm ready to to readdress it um, so that's been a lot of fun i i just started sitting around writing stuff and and since i knew there was no time you know i had as much time as i wanted really um I contacted a couple of friends, um, Mike 
good friend Rick Otto is a, a wonderful poet and actor. Uh, he's actually written some amazing things uh, about Kobe Bryant. Uh, he wrote this incredible um, 20 poems uh, that typify, that talk about, that illustrate Kobe's 20 seasons in the NBA. And it's amazing work. I hope it's okay that I talk about um, that with Rick, but I, really? I think it'll be okay because it's a really, truly beautiful work. And so I asked Rick if he'd like to write some songs, which he'd never done. And he said, well, I'll try. So he would start sending me lyrics and I would see some things in those lyrics and I would write back and say, this is great. Let me edit it and I'll get back to you. And I'd do some editing or text him the idea back. And and he would go, wow, I love this. And and so we'd go back and forward on texts, never meeting, and, and write a whole song. And, um, and, and some of the lyrics here are... Extraordinary. They're quite nice, and, and uh, well, nice. I, I think it's very beautiful. Uh, there's a lot of very heartfelt things and stuff that I like, um, and yeah, so that's kind of the way we put it together. And um, by I think July of 2020, uh, we had a couple of songs, and and the first thing I recorded, by the way, just so you know how it started, um, my son Elliot, who was 15 at the time, um, great singer. And uh, I asked him if he wanted to cut a song while well, we had all this time on our hands. And, and my other boy, Charlie, who also was living at home at the time, um, he was 22 at the time. And, and it was like, let's record something because he's a great musician and engineer. So we had a couple of mics lying around that I'd gotten from my good friend, Skipper Wise, who he runs a company called Blue Microphones. I think they're called Neat Microphones now or something like that. Uh, Skipper's a good, good friend and he gave me a couple of wonderful mics. So we started recording songs. And the first thing we, we cut was um, Here, There and Everywhere, the, the Beatles song. And um, it came out really nice, really, really nicely. And and, uh, and I thought, well, this is, maybe we can do something here. Maybe we can do a little project. Build. And they were into it, the kids were into it. So it wasn't like their their old dad saying, come on, guys, let's do something. They were actually into doing it, so that was cool. Has that it was, always been that, that way with your kids, in, in the sense of have they always thought well, what you do is pretty cool? I mean, I thought so. I think they do, although, you know, they have their own genres of music that, that obviously they prefer and that they like and that they listen to all the time. Um, Charlie, for example, is a, he's a wonderful musician who, you know, studied at um, USC, um, for music production and stuff like that. And, and he's a wonderful engineer as well as a great piano player. So his thing is rap, rap and hip hop. That's his real love. Uh, and he's making beats for, for people like um, rappers, like First. And he's worked with Two Chains and some of those guys. And wow. some guys, you know, rap heavy. Fucking shit, I'm telling you. <laughs> really great stuff. I, I love it, actually. The musicianship is unbelievable yeah and, and charlie's going to get a chance to really play his part in that because you know um he's engineering for them he's writing for them he's making beats for them and and it's getting really cool he just did some stuff with billy Rax. it's crazy that i really like so i mean it's it's wonderful so yeah they they like what that their dad's done this and they love the fact that they've come to concerts all through their life and they know, you know, Elton is like their their uncle. You know, it's like, you know, Uncle Elton will look at. In fact, it's funny because Elton called up. Um, I sent him the album, this uh, deeper than my roots, and I sent him it, and he called me and he was like, "My God." Uh, we were having a video chat and and he said, "This is like, so sweet." He said, "This is the sweetest album I think I've ever heard, and how great that you've got your kids involved to do it." And he said, let me speak to Elliot. You know, he's very kind of brash in that way. Let me, let me, I just want to speak to Elliot. So I took the phone upstairs to Elliot and he was just getting ready for school. And Elton said, okay, I've got to tell you, I didn't like listen to the whole conversation, but he said, Elliot, look, the way you look, the way you sing, the way you sound, you know, it's unbelievable. You really have talent and you can, do what you want with it. And I think you should really focus on that at some point. And any help you want, I'll give you it. And wow. it was like so sweet. I mean, Elton's greatest because 
one of the things that I've always loved about Elton is that he really um, helps new artists. He champions new music all the time. Mm. Um, if he likes something and he thinks, wow, this is great, he'll call the person up, he'll call the, the actor. I mean, I've seen it myself uh, where he'll call you know, Ed Sheeran up and say, by the way, love what you do. Come and, come and talk and we'll do some stuff together. And he basically, I mean, if it wasn't for, for Elton, I don't know who would have jumped on Ed's Mm. So, you know, he they, they did the Grammy, the Grammys yeah, way back in the day. Yeah, and he pushed them. He would, he always talked about Gaga and and did whatever he could. And she was already huge, but I mean, she's um, you know, she's no godmom to to, to Zachary and Elijah, you know, Alex's case, which is wonderful. But no, the way that he helps people, like Sam Fender, for example, mm. the reason he called me, apart from to talk to Elliot the other day was to say, did you hear Sam's new album yet? Because he knows that I love Sam, Sam Fender's music. Yeah, and I great. said, actually, no, I haven't heard it. And he said, oh, you've got to get it. It's great. And um, It's an so, amazing new album. There are a lot of artists like that oh, doing so well Yeah, as Sam Fender in He's, that genre, in rock, like rock music, quite Bruce Springsteen influence. Yeah, he loves, in fact, he loves Bruce Springsteen. Bruce and Elton are two of his big idols, you know, yeah. and you can kind of hear some of that in the kind of relentless, kind of bombastic rock that he has. And his voice is just insane. I love it, you know. I like his guitar play. And mm. um, about a year, I don't know, a year and a half ago, God knows how long ago, a year ago, let's say, uh, Elton called me and said, I want to get a guitar for Sam. Because, you know, he's got like one Fender, you know, Mustang or Jazzmaster, whatever it is he plays, and he's got an acoustic, I would like you to pick out a, a guitar for him. So I went to, to my one of my local uh, stores out in uh, Thousand Oaks called Instrumental Music, which is a wonderful store. And um, I went to see John, the manager, and I said, so what have you got right now that's great in the store? And he said, ah, come into the little room. So I went into the lock and key room where you can see all the real, you know, keepers, the you know, vintage stuff really good stuff and um, so I sat there for an hour and played a few things and I found this powder blue uh, strap that you know an old one and a really 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 good one uh, with a couple of nice dents in it and scrapes so it looks really cool and um, I said yeah this is the one and so we packaged it up sell it, sent it back so that Elton could give it to, to Sam and evidently he loved it so if you see that one what playing that I chose it from and yeah that's so cool yeah that's a that's a really cool story so and, yeah. and I, w I wanted to ask as well about because we're talking about new musicians and it's undeniable that your son Elliot has an extraordinary voice like his singing is it was like I'd heard it before um and yeah so what like when did you realize that he had such a great voice? And what was the kind of tracking process for songs like Melting Snow and that there's one, Go Easy On My Heart, which has these amazing harmonies on. Right. Um, I mean, Melting Snow, I cannot stop listening to. That's great. Uh, it's such a, such a beautiful song. Um, what was the tracking process like? Because it sounds like he's got one of those voices where he, he can just sing and it sounds amazing. Well, I mean, I, we first realized just, he'd always sing. Ever since he could sing along with anything, and it was like, and as a musician, I can always tell well, this kid is right on key with everything he's doing. I mean, his intonation is great, and, you know, stuff like that. But he started doing at school, I mean, at primary or elementary school, as they say over here, he would do musical theater things. Like they, they did a version of Oklahoma. Which I guess is on their roster for all the all the schools that want to do musicals. One of them is Oklahoma, which I actually can't stand. But I went along as dads do to the, to watch, and he was singing these songs. And again, these songs are not easy songs to sing. And I was really blown away. This is when he was seven years old, and I thought, okay, watch out for that. So over the years, he would do m more musical theater stuff uh, into um, you know middle school and high school. Um, and um, it got better and better and better, his voice and his projection. And he took some lessons from, from a couple of different people, uh, great singers. And, and um, 
anyway, we knew he was he was he was good. He was really good. Uh, I didn't want to push him too much, like be this showbiz parent. That was never my intention. It still isn't. I don't do that. I don't believe in that stuff. So, um, but anyway, it was very casual. So the tracking process was, I would write, I would write a song myself, the whole thing. I'd finish it, obviously. And then I would ask Charlie, okay, record my guitar part on here in the living room or in the conservatory. We'll record it. And we'd come up with a great, I, I did the first, you know, guitars and melting snow like that. And then go, okay, that sounds great. Let's go, uh, let's get Elliot on it. So we'd go upstairs to Elliot's room, get him comfortable, sitting on, lying on the bed, whatever he wanted, you know, what, however he wanted to be. And he would run down the song once or twice. That was it. He never has to listen to something more than twice. And um, he'd just, he'd do it. And we'd fix a couple of lines. That'd be it. Done. And then I would go ahead and start building the track around. And I'm almost careful not to overdo it, but not yeah. too, too much stuff on the tracks. I, I like it just to speak for itself as much as possible, you know. And Charlie actually did some harmonies on, on that, on Melting oh, Snow. Okay. That's The other voice is Charlie on that. Um, um, what about on Go Easy On My Heart? That's all me. All the other backgrounds are me oh, on, on right. that one. Yeah. yeah. Kind of Be Beatlesy. Yeah, there you go, busted again. Yeah, very, very Beatles. -y. I'm but, all... but yeah, also a bit, you know, Elton John Bandy, which is that's my know, fault. That's you. <laughs> that's my fault. <laughs> but, yeah, and and that, funnily enough, Melting Snow was was was, was interesting because although we tracked it all uh, in the house and I played bass on it as well as electrics and Leslie and whatever different guitars, um, I asked Nigel. I called Nigel one day and I said so. What are you doing? Are you doing anything? And he went, no, no, I'm hiding away in my, my little, you know, Topanga home and all the rest of it. And, and I said, do you want to play on something? And he goes, well, what's it like? I said, well, it's got you all, all over it. I mean, you, you have to play on this song. So if you'd come to this little suit, it'd just be you and I and the engineer. That's it. And he went, okay, great. So he came down, heard the song. And I sent him the song, the rough of just me doing it. He said, I love it. You know, mm -hmm. so he came down to the studio with his sticks only because we have a drum kit in this little home studio that my friend has. And um, he sat down. I played acoustic live with him because he likes that if we do it together because we, we work so closely, Nigel and I, mm -hmm. as you can probably hear on all the Elton records. There's all sure. these accents that we do together that have really helped Elton's music over the years. You know, 100%. that thing that really gets you, you know. So, um, we, we played together and, and uh, again, he only did a couple of takes and it just sounded exactly right for me and, and for Elliot and for everybody. So it was like, great. Yeah, it really does sound sound good. And I knew from our last conversation that neither would play drums on a mm. tune, but I'm glad to say that I was able to pick that one out as I'm sure most people most who know people. you guys stuff would have been able to yeah. play a certain way. That's right. Um, and another thing about the album as a whole, not just that track, but it's you know evident on that track. Right, you've left it quite raw. Yeah. Um, do you think that music now has like, and have you ever been tempted to, you know, jump too much on fixing things on Pro Tools, and it's not the way you like to work. Right? No, I don't. I don't work that way. Um, oh, you know, the, obviously it's great. The technology is wonderful for certain things that you might want to just spruce up here and there, or obviously some effect that you might want to have, that you can you can get so many effects. Uh, I love that kind of thing. So instead of having to go through, jump through different hoops in order to get these effects, nowadays you can kind of just go online and find the kind of thing you're looking for, like maybe an applause track you're looking for. Uh, you can go through, no, that's not it. No, 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 yes, that one's good. You know, or the sound of an ocean, uh, which I use on, um, more, which is um, beautiful, and there's an ocean mixed into you know some yeah. of the stuff. Um, you can find that kind of stuff online, so that kind of thing is a little easier. Um, but for the most part, I like to keep it keep it raw as possible. Um, I do love the way that m current artists um, record to get these really cool drum sounds or bass sounds or whatever it is they're doing. Um, Case in point, I'm working 
I did a, a song with, with these two young guys uh, from Nashville um, called Lost in the Jungle. And they're, they're new, uh, phenomenal musicians and singers. They're really, really good. And uh, they kind of remind me of a conglomeration. Like, a, you know, imagine something that's got like um, um, John Mayer vocals. Um, who did, who's the, the band that did show? Um, um, the English band, Tears for Fears. Tears oh, right, for yeah, Fears. Yeah. They've just come on the podcast. Well, Kurt. Oh, Tears really? Fears okay. I love them as well. Yeah. So a, a modern version of them, you know, with kind of John Mayer sounding vocals and harmonies on that. Wow. Crazy. And uh, we wrote a song uh, called Pocket Full of Gold together. And I'm very happy to say that I love the fact that I wrote this with these guys because I think the record could do quite well. It's really cool. You should check it out. Is that, is that out now? Um, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll send you it. My, my, my buddy, Peter Bernetta, who produced it with them, um, he sent me it last night or a couple of days ago when I was in Maui, so I couldn't hear it. And I heard it uh, when I got back this morning. Uh, it's really cool. I'll send you it so you can That's check great. it out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and Peter Bennett is a great guy. We've been friends forever, and um, his son, uh, he's got two boys, Julian Bennett and Damon, and Damon has been well became Julian's manager. It's Julian that the kid is a great drummer and has turned into a record producer, and he's done some amazing things, One Direction things, Harry Styles, and All right. yeah, he's okay. a big producer Huge. now. You know, so their family. It's kind of similar to mine in a way, you know. We've got all these full of musicians, musicians and creative people. Yeah, you left it all quite um, raw. Another thing that was striking about this is, despite the fact that it's a solo record, it's such a collaborative process. Again, you've said that's how you like to work, but it was good, you know, especially for a big fan of all your guys' work to hear you singing lead on Boxer in the oh, Corner. Right. How come you only sang lead on the one tune? Well, the, the way it happened was essentially all the stuff with Elliot was sounding so good. And that was sounding like, well, this is the way the album is sounding. It's just working this way. Um, and there came a point when I went, well, okay, we've got all these great songs with Elliot doing amazing vocals and you've got all these harmonies that I've done and different things and all these guitar parts and whatever. Um, and then I thought, well, you know what, I better do at least one lead vocal since it's my record, you know. Um, so I did. And um, I'm very happy with the way it came out. Um, but essentially, and probably I'm going to do more. Like I've already started writing some stuff for future records. And I'm quite happy with the way that I'm singing now because doing lead vocals and doing backgrounds are an entirely different world. Yeah, as sure. you as you know, you know. Um, uh, so I've essentially uh, I've really focused on being a background singer my entire career because that's what myself and Nigel and Dee um, did. That's what we were known for for that over the years. I mean, do you, how when it comes to that? Because if you, you know, it's different. If you're into two chains and stuff, maybe you know you wouldn't have this vision of things. But you know, in in my head, like big Beatles fan and like these big fan of you guys, uh, those backing vocals are, I mean, they're up there. Is that how you see them? Like, is that one of the things that you're most proud of? And do you, do you kind of with with our band? Yeah, with your like you, D oh, and Nigel, like things absolutely. like Rocket Man and yeah, it's it's a very special, it's a very special. Uh, yeah, that whole thing. I mean, I remember to this day, I remember when I hear one of Elton's tracks on the radio or something like that, uh, and I hear the backgrounds, uh, I can actually remember where we were and exactly what was going on when we did those parts. You know, it's like, it's they're so important uh, to me, and, and I know to Nigel, and definitely to Dee, God rest his soul. Um, for example, I can remember when we did um, Curtains, uh, at the end of Captain Fantastic, um, because there was such a feeling that built up in these two songs, uh, We All Fall In Love in Curtains, because they're joined, as you probably know, and, yeah, yeah. and the whole thing is very, very slow and very meaningful in it. And it goes from We All Fall In Love into Curtains, and the only backgrounds of We All Fall In Love is at the very, very end. So we did those backgrounds, which were kind of big and like, like harmony, the track harmony, they're like oh, that. Yeah. And Love then that. it goes into curtains, and the very first vocal you hear is mine, on the first harmony with Elton, 
cultivate the precious flowers on that on that part of the song and um and then bit by bit then he comes in and then we all come in um for you know um well, you, you you must have had it once upon a time and when when those vocals come in i still get chills mm. when i hear them because they are really awesome and when when we were doing them i remember we all had difficulty because we were all like had lumps in our throats because it was so i mean it was really meaningful uh, and um it's a really everybody incredible had, song. you know every had moisture and tears literally you know when we were doing it it was amazing so i remember all that shit because that's important stuff and if people think that that's achieved by just doing it again and again and again that's not true you can achieve that effect by doing that and I know a lot of bands do that, and they're very meticulous about exactly when they finish. You know. We would tend to go for, well, that's the better performance. So let's go with that, and we'll build on that. And you know. natural chemistry. Was it all of yeah. you guys around the microphone? Or Actually, was it separate? It, occasionally we did that, but most of the time we had three separate microphones. And Gus would blend, you know, those. I mean, we had a great blend anyway, but so... We do both, but very often it'd be around three separate mics. Right, and I mean, just for people who don't appreciate BBs, you know, maybe they just don't listen to that level of detail. I mean, just imagine like, like just any song. I guess that's why they call it the blues about the backgrounds. I'm yeah. still standing. Right. Like any track, curtains, as you say, harmony, mm -hmm. Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. I mean, and and were you left by yourself to do to do those? Most of the time, yeah, because. He has, he, meaning E, <laughs> he with an E, has a very short attention span. So when it comes to background vocals, usually it's like, oh, the vocal, background vocals, okay, I'm off. And that would be, it. he'd be gone, you know. Um, yeah, you know, it's very famous. He's very famous for, for sort yeah. of writing songs quickly. I mean, is that the way that you work? Is that the way that you've worked on this latest yeah, record? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't take me long to write a song. In fact, very often, you know, I'd be sitting in the backyard, you know, and and I'd maybe have an old guitar with me. I'm sitting there in a pair of shorts and, and my guitar, you know, outside, and I'd come back inside and, and uh, Kay, my wife, would say, well, what have you been doing? You've been out there a couple of hours. I'd oh, I just wrote another couple of songs. And, oh, and it was like that. And almost every other day, I'd, you know, assemble these songs so rather than toiling and toiling over a song i tend to just write them really quickly and then wait until i'm ready to to finish recording them you know what i mean is it melody first usually the the the, the chords and the melody come at the same time i'll come up with a, a guitar combination you know a sequence of chords and i'll go ah, and i'll sing along with a certain part and i'll go oh, that sounds good or this is going to happen for that kind of like uh, the song you mentioned uh go easy on my heart that came to me very very quickly um and as soon as i had that see the way I, what's been really handy talking about current technology has been i'll take my trusty iphone out mm. and and i think my wife bought me one of those little camp stands that you can put them on you know uh, not a selfie stick thank god nothing like that just a little stand for it and i would just you know reverse the camera and put it in, in, in video myself when i just written the song and that was used that'd be the mode that i would go about to say oh that sounds good and yeah the, the, the vocal sounds good and yeah and very, would, would you like write down like chords and stuff or is it just a case yeah. record it and then you can just yeah. remember what it is just to, at what uh, stage did you become a good enough musician because I mean throughout your career you must have just had to be in the room with people big artists high high pressure situation or whatever right uh, and they're playing something and you just got to kind of work out your part on the spot right people with short attention spans and I mean obviously there are a lot more artists than just Elton <laughs> like the list is huge right um, and I'm imagining you know you wouldn't add all the time in the world to do that which is, of course, one of the names of the songs on your record. So it is, um, yeah. But yeah. When, when did you get good enough to just be able to play by ear like that? Were you very young? Yeah, it, it's something that just came, for me, came very naturally. It became something that I could do. Um, um, and I've never questioned it. It's just something, if I hear something automatically, I just come up with something. You know? uh, very often, when I was a kid, I'd hear 
like a Beatles song, for example, and I'd hear a harmony they'd done, and I'd stick another harmony on of my own. You know, and I think, oh, I wonder why they didn't put that harmony on, you know. And then uh, as I, you know, got older and, and more mature with my ideas, I realized that, you know, they didn't need all those other harmonies. They put the ones on that were necessary and their harmonies were amazing. You know, that's what we always based our stuff on. But no, I've always been able to, I mean, anybody, whoever it was, um, you know, walked into a studio with, with um, Ralph McTell and he'd play a song and I'd go, okay, play this and he would go oh love it you know I've always had this ability and it's been really probably the biggest gift of my entire musical arsenal that I can come up with parts really really quickly as soon as I hear something in fact as long as I you know I just hear something for example with when I first met Elton and the whole deal was when I walked in and I was very nervous when I walked in I mean I was like barely 20 years old and I think I'd been up all night smoking hash and be, be completely nuts, you know, <laughs> and got to the studio and I thought, oh, shit, I better, you know, get this together. This is, Gus Dudgeon told me uh, this is a big artist or the guy's going to be big, you know. So I was a little bit nervous. But anyway, I walked in, put my guitar case down and said, OK, what's what's happening? And met Elton, this very shy guy who didn't say anything. And um, I said, so what are we doing? And he said, well, we want a guitar part to the song. We want the guitar to start the song, and it's got to be the basis of the whole track. Okay. So the, Elton played me the riff, and I went, okay, how about this? And I played what I heard. And he went, that's it. <laughs> and it was like, okay. And um, that became Mad Man Across the Water. That was the, the first thing you hear on that track. And... So yeah, high pressure, but that's never been a problem for me. That that part is really interesting. With is, is that harmonics? Yeah. You're doing? Yeah. I mean, do you think that one of the reasons why you've retained um, these type of incredible gigs that people would kill for is mm. because you're you do think outside the box. I mean, that's quite like for your first session to just start playing like that. Yeah. Um, is that ju that's just all instinctive? Totally. Totally. I mean, I often get booked for something and then I'll maybe say, well, like they'll book me for banjo or something. And I'll hear it and say, no, that you really should have mandolin or something like that and something else. So I tend to, I'll hear something and say, well, yeah, that could maybe work, but this would be better. You know, so I, I've never been afraid of doing that. Even with Elton on that first week of these uh, sessions for Madman, um, Holiday Inn, for example, they wanted banjo. And I said, no, it should be mandolin. And in fact, we could start it just with mandolin and piano. And they were like, oh, who the fuck's this guy? You know, yeah. how dare he? And, uh, but it went, it worked immediately. So what's your favorite mandolin part that you've ever played? Ever played? Oh my God. Um, I think probably, well, that's a good one. Holiday Inn is a good one. Mm. Um, Captain Fantastic is a pretty good one. Um, Texan Love Song is a good one. Mm -hmm. And in Magna Carta, we did a track called Sponge that I wrote. And I think later on it became the title tune for a gardening program <laughs> on Radio 2. I think it was called um, hold on, Beachwood Gardens by memory. And what it was the theme tune? Yeah. yeah. My mum called me up one day and said, Son, one of your pieces is on the radio <laughs> for some gardening show, you know, about, I don't know, dusting off your cabbages or something. But it, it's a cool little part, you know. Well, that, that reminded me of wanting to talk about uh, the song Black Scotland on the right. record. Because, uh, I mean, you've still retained your Scottish accent, of course. It's quite difficult, to, but it's become a little bit Americanized. Oh, completely. I'd be surprised if it didn't. I've been here for... 40 years old. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, and to be expected, in a way, uh, it stayed pretty strong on the Scottish front. Uh, how often do you go back home uh, to Scotland? Not as often as I like. Um, I still have my sister Liz and her husband Bill still live there in Edinburgh, where I was born. And my sister Annie lives in uh, Yorkshire with her husband Tom. And um, we see each other, usually it would be once every couple of years when I'd be touring. And then I'd spend a couple of days with 
either of them in Scotland or in Yorkshire in Hangout and we've always been very close uh, but with Covid obviously it's been it's been probably three years since I've seen them which is not good but since I became a, a, a Zoom ninja um, mm. I host all these different Zoom things so so that's been amazing over the last couple of years and so we still see each other but yeah my, my Scottish roots um, are deep and will always be there. They'll always be very strong because I cultivated all this um, this love of traditional music, uh, Scottish and Irish music, which is very similar. Um, if, if people are aware of Irish music, a lot of it came from Scotland and vice versa. A lot of these great old fiddle tunes and bagpipe tunes um, were developed mainly by the Dubliners, my favourite Irish folk group when I was about 15. And um, because when I heard them, my life changed dramatically. I heard their music, um, and I I heard it in a in a way that I heard the the mad, you know, crazy, just like whirling dervishy type music, you know, and um, and also being into the incredible string band at that time, I was very into that kind of mystic yeah, side of music, so. and still am. I the still, I'm, coat, yeah. I'm a total hippie. I mean, I really am totally into that whole thing um, because it really it stands the test of time, all of that shit. I mean, stuff that came from Sergeant Pepper, I still use that kind of, you know, ideology in, in my writing because it's still, to me, very significant in music and in art. And yeah. it should be. It should not be mocked or laughed at because it's a great, great thing. And my daughter, Juliet, still employs that kind of sensibility into her art and she's a phenomenal artist but yeah. getting back to, to what you were saying about uh, Scotland and, and black Scotland yeah well, how late was that in the in the well we I, I actually wrote that 10 years ago all oh, right okay. and um, my son Jesse who plays drums on this album also on about <laughs> five of his tracks who's a monster drummer uh, a great musician engineer himself and um, he played drums remotely from his place on, on this album. But back then, he was staying at the house, and my son Tam was staying at the house uh, in California here. And um, we were doing some recording, as because since we all play, that's part of, that's the family business, if you like. We all play in the engineer, and this is how, how we do things uh, in the Johnstone clan. <laughs> and um, so it was, again, it was like I'd come up with this thing. I, I was messing around with a, an electric... Uh, thing with my pedal board and some X and delays and and cool things and I came up with this really crazy thing and it was really sounding good to me so I said I've got an idea let's record it just live so Jesse had his Pro Tools kit uh, and set up um, mics on, on the drum kit that we have in the corner of my room and then he set up a, a mic for my on my amps for my electric stuff and we literally did it straight away it was just one long take the idea came to me and we did it and um, straight away I said I know what I'm going to call that it's going to be Black Scotland and I got Bob Birch to play bass on it now the thing is this is very again very meaningful for me because Bob passed away um, some years ago and um, and as you know we lost Guy Babylon also um, yeah, back in 2009 so it's been a really tough few years back then uh, using both of those amazing musicians and dearest friends of mine. But Bob played the most amazing bass part on this track, uh, Black Scotland, that, that I did for this record. And I, I, I was so pleased with the way it came out, and I could never think, well, what am I going to use it for? So when the, the solo album idea, with the album, my album came up, I'll put it on that. It'll be one of the tracks. And the other one that I did, um, again, with Jesse and, and Tam, and Charlie playing various, when he was only about 10, playing piano stuff on it. Uh, it's a wonderful mishmash. And that one's called Waltz Disney. Waltz Disney, yeah. 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 Well, of course, that was Tam's idea, the, the name. I'm going, like, what can it be? He said, what about Walt Disney? And I'm going, you know, okay, with a Z? Okay, a Z for you English people. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, but, but the funny thing about it was, was um, the reason they came up with it was the old Scottish joke. You know, about um, um, about, about Fred Astaire and like, what's the difference between Fred Astaire and Walt Disney? 
And you know, I don't know what's the difference between Fred Astaire and Walt Disney. And the answer is, well, Fred Astaire, Fred Astaire smokes, but Walt Disney. And that's for all you Scottish fans up there. And that's where the title came from, for, for that one. But getting back to Black Scotland, that's got another great story. The way that happened, I was working with all these artists back in 19... whatever. Uh, Little Richard was one of the, the acts, and on the same act that was Brian, the same show that was Brian Wilson, Don Henley, Cheryl Crow, Julie Andrews, um, just an amazing collection of people. And I was the musical director, so I had maybe 30 minutes with each act to work out to do a quick rehearsal for this this big show. Actually, Bernie Bernie Toffin was directing it. It was a, for the AIDS Project, Los Angeles in like 19, I want to say 91. I think that's a good guess, something like that. Anyway, so we're rehearsing with Little Richard, who's one of my idols. I'm going like, I, lo you know, I love this guy. So we're playing um, Great Balls of Fire and Lucille with Little Richard, right? Unbelievable. I'm just in heaven, <laughs> rocking out like crazy. And at the end of the, the first run through, Richard turned around to me and he says, where are you from? You know, and I said, uh, I'm from Scotland. He said, well, you must be from the black part of Scotland, honey. And I just, that was it. We're all laughing. We was like laughed around the studio. But I thought, black Scotland, that's going to be it. <laughs> so that's where that came from. Wow, what a memory. What a lineup as well. That sounds like, but I mean, I guess over the course of your career, yeah. you've done so many things like that. Why did you choose to call the album Deeper Than My Roots? Um, well, one of the tracks was um, I'd named Deeper. And I think right about the same time I'd be, I started, because it was one of the last songs that I wrote for the record. Right. And, and uh, I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to have to come up with an album title, you know, at some point. And um, that was the one that, I guess it was the same week that I'd written Deeper and I thought, ooh, Deeper Than My Roots is pretty cool. And uh, that's just when it came up. Are you itching to get back out there? I, I'm ready. I mean, I'm not itching because quite honestly, I'm not holding my breath. I'm just going, who knows what's going to happen. It you know? happens if it happens type of thing. Yeah, it, that's kind of the way you have to look at things. I don't want to get, yeah. I'm not building myself up because I don't want to be disappointed. I'd rather, yeah. okay, well, let's just see what happens. But yeah, that was the original uh, idea was to have it come out when I'm actually out there invisible and doing something obviously to maximize you know the sales or whatever yeah, just so that people know what I'm what I'm doing at that time well, and yeah, I'll, yeah for sure I'll make sure that it's leadingly obvious when this podcast is released it. and we'll we'll time it for then beautiful um, as well but I wanted to ask um, as one of my final questions do you think this is gonna be it I think when's When's, when are the current dates up till? Is it like sometime in 2023? And do you think that will be the last tour at the end of 23? Or do you reckon they'll add dates? Uh, I reckon that's this is the last tour. I reckon this is it, for sure. Um, as far as what Elton may do afterwards, who knows? I mean, he may, you know, there's always the chance, I think, this is my, this is my take on things, he may do something... Uh, I don't, he'll never tour. This is the last tour for sure. But he may do maybe a one-man, uh, one-off show in London or somewhere else. I don't know. Uh, he's not going to... I don't think he's going to stop playing. That's never going to happen. And probably not writing. But I'm sure there'll be the one-off situation. Mm. Um, situation, you know, where he'll play a special event or something like that. I'm sure that's going to happen. But as far as getting together as a band again, I, I don't see that happening because, you know, touring in, in the way that we've toured since day one, we've always done things as big as possible. Now, granted, back in 1972, it was pretty basic. Um, we might have thought it was big. This is the big time. But, you know, we had like nothing. There was no PA, basically. There was very little of anything. Um, but huge crowds. Huge crowds. And then that built up and built up, you know, and... Um, so this, the, the Farewell Tour, as, as you know, is, is phenomenal staging and all the rest of it. So this is the last time we'll tour, in, in, you know, as a band in this way. Yeah, yeah. it does seem like yeah. that. It seemed like it was a bit of a hovering question mark before yeah. 
but now it does now seem like we're done you know because i mean god i mean i'm i just turned 70 this year so by the time we finish this i'm going to be 72 out and going to be like 76 or whatever it is and like holy shit you know we'll all be coming out in walkers and zimmer frames and stuff like that and and the last american show from what i can see is at the dodger stadium and right now it's Dodger. yeah that's dodger stadium that will be is that going to be a quite an, uh, an emotional thing for you guys very much, I because I, I you know I still remember the the first couple that we did there, and I know we did a couple back in the nineties or thing with Eric or maybe Billy. I can't even remember who it was, but but it wasn't the same because it wasn't just our band yeah. playing Dodger Stadium. So doing that again with just our band will be very moving. And the fact it's the last LA, holy shit, people will be there'll be a lot of tears here. I'm sure. 100% and it's yeah. going to be great to have you and Nigel on stage this time at Dodger Stadium. Uh, yeah, because he, you know, he wasn't that, in the band then. He's ready. He's ready to do that. It's going to be. It always was a, you know, put his nose out of joy a bit when he'd say, oh, somebody would say, oh, Dodger Stadium must have been a great moment. I wasn't fucking there. Yeah, <laughs> like that. So yeah. it'd be great for him. And, and after you know, all this time, you know, when when you guys are in your seventies to be playing in a stadium like that, I know it's ridiculous. It's like the stone. Who do we think we are? <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I think it's well deserved because when we first started going to shows, it was you know in big arenas, but this is it's now kind of quadrupled the audience size. So yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, it's nice. And, and you know, congratulations for being Thank an you. integral part of one of the greatest you know bands. Um, of all time in my view and your album Deeper Than My Roots is also incredible I'd highly recommend it thanks so much David for coming on the podcast thanks Tom pleasure this episode of the greatest music of all time podcast is brought to you by St. Aubin Retail and Distribution St. Aubin Retail and Distribution is an independent retailer offering high quality products direct to consumer at great prices from home and furniture to clothing and accessories to electronics and entertainment whether you're looking for a new MacBook, a face mask, an Amazon Echo Assistant, a camera, or even a comfortable mattress for your bed, St. Aubin Retail and Distribution has got you covered, giving you excellent value for money and attentive customer service, no matter what you're looking for. Head to stauburnretail.com to browse their range of amazing products.